My name's Rob Allen. I do stuff with Zen Framework 2. I do lots of Zen Framework stuff. I'm well known for doing Zen Framework stuff. And I've started moving into API building. Um, I think the industry is moving that way. As a web industry, as a web application builders, we are slowly moving to the situation where we are building front-end websites and putting all our business logic into a separate API. And one of the reasons we are doing this is that we are targeting different clients now. It's not just the website. We have the website, we have the mobile apps, we have other clients who are getting our data and needing to do something with it. Or if we're really lucky, we have other clients that are pushing data into our system. So take Twitter, for instance. They get their data from third parties pushing data into their system. And APIs are good for this. This is what APIs are for. So I think we're going to be building more of them. Who here is building APIs at the moment? Who have to do this because of the bright lights? Yeah, a good few of you, about half maybe, something like that. And the other half of you will be building APIs within the next three years. That's the way we're going. However, if this works, APIs are hard. They're not very easy to write well. And the reason they're not very well hard, so they're not very easy to write well, is that there's lots of things to think about with an API. Like there are with websites, there are lots of um, features, things that you need to build into your API that are relatively boring. They're the bits that nobody really wants to write. But they have to be written if you're going to have a decent API. Um, we work on the web, so we're talking HTTP. We have things like content negotiation. We have things like method negotiation. We have to worry about um, validation. We have to worry about versioning, authentication, authorization. These are all key features of your API that aren't very interesting to write. Um, personal pet peeve of mine is error reporting. The amount of APIs I consume that cannot report errors sensibly drives me up the wall. It's hard to get error reporting right, and most people don't do it. So if you're writing an API, and at least half of you are, make sure you do good error reporting. You will make me happy. That's important. APIs come, certainly in terms of web APIs at least, in two major groups. We have RPC type APIs, we have RESTful APIs. Um, who here writes RPC APIs, remote procedural call? Nobody's prepared to admit it? Ah, oh, one person. I reckon more, than, more of you do that than you realize. Um, the thing about an RPC type API is that you're running code on the server, and you're treating it as you are running a method or running a function. So remote procedural call. Um, typical endpoints are more verb-like. Send email, get current time. That's the characteristic of an RPC type um, API. One of the more classic ones is login systems. If you're going to log in OAuth 2, for instance, it's very RPC-like. And then we have RESTful APIs, and RESTful APIs are the cool ones. They're the ones that everyone writes because they work really well with HTTP. They leverage HTTP and the architecture of HTTP very, very well. Um, specifically, through two main reasons. Firstly, HTTP verbs. So we have resources on our server, and we interact with them via HTTP verbs. We have post, we have get, we have patch, etc. So we are describing the action we want to take on our resource via the HTTP built-in system. The other thing about RESTful APIs is that they're stateless. There is no such thing as a session. Every single thing that you send into your server's endpoint via a RESTful call has to be sent in that call. You cannot depend on anything having been done previously or anything that will be done in the future. That's a key feature of a RESTful API. 
And the side effect of that is that you can now cache things well. You can scale using the built-in HTTP infrastructure. This is why people like RESTful APIs, but they don't work for everyone. So RPC still exists, and you will still write some RPC stuff. So with that sort of uh, side note out of the way, let's talk about Apigility, which is what we're here for. And it is pronounced Apigility. It's a pun on agility. It is not API agility. Apigility. It's an opinionated API builder. So the point of the tool is to help you write a good API without having to do the boring bits. So from their web page, simplify the creation and maintenance of useful, easy to consume, and well-structured well application programming interfaces, APIs. The key thing is well-structured. In the same way that um, full-stack frameworks provide structure to web applications, AppAgility provides structure to APIs. It is API-centric. It provides the structure for you. It does all the boilerplate. There are two key components to AppAgility. There is the administration system that you run in development mode that enables you to configure your API and to build your API. It is a web-based system. And then there is a runtime API engine that actually executes and runs your API. So there are two halves to the AppAgility system. Obviously, it is written in PHP because we're at PHP UK. It's built on Zen Framework 2. You don't need to know a lot about Zen Framework 2 in order to use AppAgility. It is just the underlying components to the system. So how would you get started with something like Agility? It uses Composer. We were all in your day's talk yesterday, or if not, who here is not using Composer? Good, that is a great answer. Everyone uses Composer now. It is the way to do things in 2015, if you're in PHP world. So you install using Composer's create project. We've now got a project called Music. We turn on development mode. That's the administration um, interface. It is not enabled by default. So you have to turn it on. You do not run it on your live servers, because otherwise people could go and change your API. So you run it locally. Because we're running it locally, we can use a built-in PHP server. Because we're all running PHP 5.4 or higher, aren't we? Yes, we are. <laughs> um, Agility will actually run on 5.3, but don't tell anyone. 5.4 or above, don't run end of life. And you get an admin system that looks something like that. It's very pretty. Right, so let's show you how it looks in practice. So let's write a hello world for an API. So what does hello world look like for an API system? What's useful? One of the most useful things you can do for your clients is to create an endpoint that will always return something so that your clients can be sure that your API is up and running. We could call this a heartbeat. We could call this an echo. We could call this um, a ping. It doesn't really matter what we call it. It's a good practice to have an endpoint that your clients can use to test their setup to make sure they can talk to your API. And it turns out it's really easy to write. So let's write one of those. So this is a screencast. So hopefully I can manipulate the system well enough to run it. All right, so what I've done is I've gone to the Agility admin, I've clicked on Settings, and it takes me through to this page. I can then move down to the APIs page, and I can create a new API. All APIs need a name. We need to have something to um, distinguish one API from another. We give it a name. This one we'll call Ping. We type Ping, we hit Create API, and the system works and clicks a little bit, and we now have a API. I'm going to create an RPC service for this. It's nice and simple, less code involved. We like that. Um, so I go to the RPC services. I pick Create New RPC Service. I give my service a name. And I'm not very imaginative. We'll call the service ping as well. Um, and then I give it, need to give it a route to match. Route to match is the endpoint. 
it's the URL that this particular service will run against. And other unimaginatively, let's call it slash ping. So if you go and hit slash ping, you'll hit this particular RPC service. Create the RPC service, it works and clicks, and now we have an RPC API, and we've created some source code as well. In ping controller. So let's switch to our editor and find that ping controller file. There it is. Hopefully it's big enough to read. Cool. So Agility has created some files on disk for you. The admin system only creates source code. So all your source code is still in Git. You can still diff. You can see exactly what the system has done for you. You can choose not to use it and do it all by hand if you wanted to. I wouldn't recommend that, but you can do that. And here we've got a controller. This is looking very familiar, hopefully, to anyone who's used a framework before. And it's a ping controller, and it's called ping action. So when someone hits the ping API endpoint, this action is going to run. This action is going to do nothing at the moment because App Agility doesn't know what you want to do. This is a bit you have to write. So you have to return an array of the data you want to send back to the client. So I'm going to return an array with the time. Very, very simple. So you hit this endpoint, you'll get ACK back, and it'll have the current time. How hard can that be? So let's switch to terminal and run a curl command. Um, quick side again. If you're going to write good APIs, make sure you are familiar with how to test them. The first person that should be consuming your API is you. Learn curl. Learn HTTP. Learn Postman. I don't care which client you use, but learn a client really, really well. It's very important that you exercise your API yourself. There's nothing like finding usability problems with an API if you have to use it. So this is curl. Who here uses curl? Yeah, quite a few of you. So curl minus S for silent, minus capital H because I would send a header, and I'm sending the JSON, except, the accept header for application JSON. My endpoint, localhost curl on 8888 because that's where my PHP web server is running, slash ping, my endpoint. And then I pipe the result through a Python module called json.tool, which very handily formats my JSON for me and makes it look pretty. That's all it does. So we run that, and we get ACK back with a time. One, four, two, three, whatever. And we're done. So I wrote one line of code. I returned ACK with a timestamp on it. So what did I get? as a result of using App Agility rather than writing my own um, API from scratch. I got some code. App Agility created a module for me. It then created a ping directory and put some, folders in, uh, some files in it, ping controller factory and a ping controller. Uh, the ping controller factory should give you a clue that we quite like dependency injection nowadays. It's the way of the future if you want to test anything. So, Dependency injection enables you to inject your dependencies into your controller in a fairly sane and clean way. And then ping controller has got the action that we actually execute. All quite easy. I got JSON. I returned an array out of my controller. JSON was sent to the um, client. So HTTP is another RESTful um, command line runner. It's a lot shorter for typing commands onto slides. So that's why you're seeing it here. So yeah, I get JSON back. That's handy. I, App Agility is opinionated. We send back JSON. We think JSON is the right answer. If you want to send back CSV, if you want to send back XML, if you want to send back some other weird format, do it yourself. Well, actually, go and get a module from Packagist, because there's bound to be one. But out of the box, it's JSON. JSON works really, really well. It's a very nice transfer format. We get method negotiation for free. What do I mean by method negotiation? I mean that 
my endpoint only accepts get. If you try to post to my ping endpoint, I'm not going to accept you sending me data. I'm not interested. So I send back a 405 method not allowed. This is what I talk about error reporting as well. Send back the right headers. Send back the right status codes. It's a bit tedious to have to do this. Apagility has done it for me. I also have options handling built in. So options is one of the methods on HTTP. If you hit the options method against any endpoint, you should get back a list of available verbs for that endpoint. That's what it should do for you. Hand up if you've actually implemented options in your API. 50% right, of you are writing APIs. One person has implemented options. Error reporting. What happens if you hit an endpoint that doesn't exist? What should happen? A 404 should be returned. That's quite easy. We send that status 404. How do we tell our client what's gone wrong in a structured manner? Turns out there's a IETF draft, a RFC on, it, on its way through approval, called HTTP problem, which is a structured way of returning errors. So if you report your errors using HTTP problem, then clients can trust what data they're going to get back. They can start interpreting this data automatically. They can stick it into things like Logstash that Ben was talking about yesterday, and they can start analyzing what's going on. Structured error reporting is really, really helpful. And there's a standard for it. We implement that standard. It comes with Apagility. So 404 not found is your status code. We set the right content type. So application slash problem plus JSON. And then we send back the actual uh, structured data, which is a detail, a status, a title, and a type, which can give some clues to your client on how to fix the problem. I'm a big fan of helping my clients solve their own problems. If they do that, they won't email me. Provide as much information as you can in your error reporting. Accept checking works the same way. What happens is someone asks for XML. I've just told you, we do JSON. If someone asks for XML, I have to error. I error using HTTP problem. It's built in. I didn't have to think about any of this. It just came as part of the framework. And to get version in. It turns out that when you write an API, you don't get it right first time. I know this is a shock. But it turns out that sometimes you make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, you end up having to create backwards incompatible changes. When you make a backwards incompatible change, you upset every client that's ever used your API. If you do it twice, they will go to your competitor. Nobody likes having their system stop working because the endpoint over there has changed what it does. So we invented versioning to solve this problem. And we're developers, so there's more than one way to do it, obviously. The two most common ways of doing versioning are media types and URL-based. Media types are the proper way for some definition of proper. When I say media type, I mean that we change the accept header that our clients are using. So our client will request application slash vnd.ping.v1 or ping.v2, depending on which version of the API they want to receive. It's out of band. It's not part of the actual response coming back. It's a good way to do it. It's a right old pain to do if you want to test in a browser. So half the APIs in the world stick the version in the URL. It's very pragmatic solution. Stick the version in the URL. Nobody gets confused about which version they're using. It's right there where they can see it. Apagility supports both. If you are particularly religious about it, you can turn off the one you don't like. In practice, you leave them both on. It doesn't really matter. In Apagility, a new version is new code. So your old version continues to run. And we do this via namespaces. 
So version one lives in a namespace, version two lives in a namespace. When you create version two of your API, we copy all of version one's code into version two, and then you go and fix the problems. Version one will continue to be the way it was before. You don't make a mistake and accidentally screw up version one. So here's an example. Let's say that we're a bit fed up with timestamps and we'd actually prefer to return a human readable date in our um, ping acknowledgement. So we created a version two for that. This is how the clients will access it. So if you hit slash v1 slash ping, you're going to get version one. You're going to get the timestamp, just a straight integer. Similarly, if you hit, uh, hit slash ping, but set an accept header of vnd.ping.v1plusjson, then again, you'll get the version one copy of the code. And in version two, we're going to get the pretty date time. Much easier to ring. Notice, if you do not choose a version, we default to version one. We believe in minimum surprises for our clients. Clients hate surprises. Every possible type of client hates surprises. So if you haven't set an accept header, sorry, if you haven't set a version, you haven't done the right accept header, you will always get version one, even if the API is now on version three. OK, so that's RPC. That's the features of App Agility. Let's move on to talk about the RESTful side of things. There are two types of RESTful API built into App Agility, or RESTful service, as we call them. We have database-connected ones, and we have code-connected ones. Database-connected ones are very, very simple to implement. You simply point App Agility at the database table, and you get an API that lets you manipulate that database table without having to do any additional work. So if you need to get an API up and running quite quickly, this is a very good way to do it. It is also remarkably limited, because it's all the code has been done behind the scenes. So code-connected APIs enable you to do the work yourself. You get to control everything about your RESTful API, how it works, what it does with the data coming in, how it returns the correct representation of the resource. You can do it all yourself should you need to. Which one you pick depends on the type of problem you're trying to solve. I tend to find that when I've seen App Agility projects out in the world, they're a mixture of the two. That's quite common. So let's do another screencast as shown how we actually build a RESTful API, a, a database connected one. Where's my cursor gone? Oh, there we are. So here we are, the system. We go to the settings area to set up a database adapter. We have to tell App Agility how to talk to our database. It's using PDO, so it's all quite easy. Create a new database adapter. Give it a name that we can reference later. This is a music database, so DB Music. I pick a driver. That's a list of database drivers that we support. This is where you start seeing some of the underlying Zen Framework 2 code. So if Zen Framework 2's database system can talk to a database, then App Agility can talk to it. So you've got things like DB2. You've got um, all the PDO ones, um, SQL Server, Postgres, etc., all in there. Pick one. We're going to pick MySQL. So we're going to need to give it a database name, music. We're going to need a username, Rob. We're going to need a password. Don't use this in production. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we can hit save. We've now got a database. Let's go over to the API section and create a new API. So rather imaginatively, we'll call it music. Words and clicks, we get our music API. This time, we're going to pick a RESTful service. So we're going to create a new RESTful service. And here's where you can pick whether you want a code-connected service or whether you want a DB-connected one. If you want code-connected, you simply give it a name and you're done. If you want database-connected, then you go to the database tab and you pick from the list of available adapters. 
In this case, we have our music one. And then you specify which database table you actually want to connect to. In this case, the album table. Words and clicks, we've now got a RESTful API called album. A right, couple of things here. It's automatically named our endpoint for us. So the endpoint it has given us is slash album slash album ID. And if you look at it, the album ID is in square brackets, which means it's optional. So this endpoint will accept two different types of data. It will accept a collection on slash album, and it will accept a specific album or specific resource on slash album slash 43, or something like that. So one endpoint is supporting two different types of data, individual albums and collections of albums. So you can see that further down here, where in terms of the accept um, check-in, we can choose which verbs we accept for entities and which verbs we accept for the collection. We might not want people to be able to delete every single album in the system, for instance. That choice is up to us. Personally, I don't like singular in my endpoints for collections. So I don't like that it's called album. So I'm going to edit that and change it to albums, because it makes me feel happy. So I go to the system, I choose edit, I change it to albums. I can change other things, like how many um, records per page. I can change whatever else I need to change. I can ignore the rest and just hit save. So I've altered the endpoint to be slash albums over to the browser. Sorry, over to the browser, over to the um, terminal, and let's run some more curl. First one, let's hit the slash albums endpoint. Just straight hit the collection, what do we get back? Guess what? We get some JSON. We get the collection back. And it's embedded in a format to make it structured. JSON is intrinsically not very structured in terms of our agreement of what goes where. So there are four standards out there, that, and we use one of those. So there we go, we've got our albums. There's four or five in here. They're whatever was at Amazon that was selling well when I wrote this demo. Whoever Megan Trainer is, for instance, I've got no idea. So there we go, we've got a collection. How about if we try to create a, um, a new album? This time we need to post. To create a new album in a collection or a new resource in a collection, we post to the collection endpoint and we will get a new resource within that collection. So I use curl again, I have to send the method, which is minus x for some weird reason, post as our method, hit the collection endpoint, have to set our content type header now. We have to tell App Agility what type of data we are sending it. We're going to send it JSON. Set the accept header, what data we would like come back, and then send some data in. So I'm going to send in the charlatans and modern nature. And App Agility will create my album for me and it will return a representation of that album back to me. So by posting to the collection, I get back the album itself. I also get the URL of this particular album, uh, localhost 888 slash album slash seven, as part of the structured data. And it's also in the headers. So you can find out where the endpoint for your new album is. So that's quite easy. Looking at the data, we decide that actually we probably should have spelt the title of the album with capital letters. So to change a resource, we put to the resources endpoint. Now, when you use put, you have to send in every piece of data. Put is a replace. So whatever you send it will replace whatever representation of that resource is on that particular endpoint. So although I only want to change the title, I have to pass in the artist as well. Otherwise, it will be cleared for me. That is what put does. So here I am putting, um, correcting the title and sending the artist in again. 
and it works and clicks for a bit and will return to me again the resource quite handily and you can see I've capitalized modern nature. The other way of doing an update in a RESTful API is patch. Patch is a more recent verb. It's not in the original standard, it's in a later one. And I've forgotten the numbers. There are so many numbers with RFCs. If you patch and use the patch verb, you only need to send in the data you are changing. So in this case, I want to change the artist's name, so I only have to send the artist's data. I don't have to send the album's title again. Patch will do the right thing for me. That's why it was invented. And again, you get a representation of the resource once it has been updated. So that's all fine and dandy. Finally, delete is the other thing you're likely to do with your resources. And you send the delete verb in, and it will delete your record. And it sends back nothing. There is no data left. You've just deleted it. OK, was that fairly clear? Yes. Quick walkthrough of how APIs work. Cool. So what did we get this time? For absolutely no code whatsoever, I got a full RESTful CRUD interface to that database table. That's quite cool. You need to get something prototyped up, get something going, test out whether this is the right sort of data, this is the right sort of API you want to create. This is quite a quick way to do that. We got hypermedia links in our JSON output. So we are trying to be compliant with level three of the Richardson maturity model. That's part and parcel of it. You didn't have to think about that. We've got pagination. That's quite important for large data sets. And obviously, we got all the other things that we talked about earlier. So it's still versioned. It's still got method control. It's still got content type checking, et cetera. That is all built in to our prototype or into our API without any effort on our part. So the code this time has gone into the music module. It's in a folder which is called album because that's the name of the service I gave it. So I can have multiple API services within the same module. So in this case, it's the album service. And it created two classes for me. Two files were created behind the scenes, a collection class and an entity class. Um, you don't need to touch either of these files unless you want to do any customization. Personally, I've never ever touched them. If I need to do a customized API, I would have started with a code connected API. Database DB connected APIs work best if you let them do their thing. Hypermedia in JSON. This is the structure we are using. So the actual data itself, the artist, the ID, and the title, are three top-level elements of the JSON object. We are using a standard called Hypermedia Application Language, which is another RFC draft. It's currently in voting, I believe. This defines structure to JSON in the same way as we already have structure in XML. So um, the link tag in XML or in your, in your HTML, you can have a rel, and then you can have the link itself. So you can do rel self, or you can do um, rel canonical, things like that in your HTML websites. In JSON, there is no standard at the moment. This is standard that will be released soon, hopefully. And it's defined by a tag name underscore links, or an element name. And then you can have as many links as you like. Each one has got a name, which is equivalent to rel in HTML, and then the href, etc. So here I have a linked self. And that whole link section is part of something called the hypertext as the engine of application state, which has got the worst acronym in the world. But you'll come across it. And one of the nice things about this acronym, incidentally, is that it is dead easy to Google for which is quite handy. And there's an article there that I've put at the bottom of the screen um, by Roy Fielding, the guy who invented REST, about why you should have a link section in all your resources. 
and all your collections and why it is really important to the way REST works fundamentally that you should be trying to get to um, level three of the richness and maturity model. So the same thing happens in a collection. This time, the data of the collection is at the top level. So the data of the collection at the top level is the page count, the page size, and the total number of items. That's the collections data. Then each individual album resource is in an array within the embedded section. So this is part of what application HAL plus JSON specifies. So you will find your collection data, all the albums themselves, inside the embedded um, section. And again, we have the links section. But now, because we are in a collection, we've got pagination coming in. So you've got first and last in this case, as well as self. Pagination itself, if you're somewhere in the middle of a, a set of data, then you're going to get first, last, previous, and next. That's all provided for you. Your data is nicely paginated. Your mobile clients will love you. They are memory constrained. They really don't like it if you send them 100,000 objects in a collection. It's bad. I know we did it once for joined in. It was a real mistake. Paginate your data collections. So I've just connected a database table to the internet. Can anyone spot any problems? Yes. Yes, people can put in whatever they like into my database. They can do bad things. Um, I think we should take it as read this day and age to never ever trust anyone on the internet. So you need to validate and filter any data that comes into your system. So hence, it is built into Agility. We can't have a database-connected API where we're taking a database table in your MySQL and putting it on the internet without a way to validate and filter. So this is built in as well. The nice thing about it is that it's entirely admin-based, so it's quite easy to do. And it is tested whilst you are doing the routing. So it fails very, very quickly. And more importantly, it means that invalid data never hits your code. The validation and filtering has happened before it gets to your code base. So the bit of code you're writing, you can trust it has already been filtered and validated. So that's quite handy. Obviously, because we want to be well-structured, we want to be a good API, we are going to return the correct um, HTTP status when you get things wrong, or when your client gets things wrong more accurately. So 400s, 422s, etc. And again, it's done via the admin. We like the admin. So here's another screencast for you. How would we add validation to our system? There's my, there it is. So here's our album service again. This time we edit it and we go to the Fields tab and we can add a new field. So I'm going to create a field called Artist. So I, for each database column, I need to create a field. Call it Artist, hit Create New Field. I've now got my Artist field. I can drop it down and then I get some fields, things to fill in. Firstly, I can give it a description. So the artist that created this album. I don't let me write your documentation. I'm not very good at it. Um, I can give it a validation failure message, some information about how you're supposed to fill in this field. So the artist's name must be no more than 100 characters. Then I could have my filters. Filters will change the data. So what a filter does is it will manipulate the data that comes in from the client, change it in some way, and then pass it on to your application. It's a normalization stage, if you like. It doesn't validate, it filters. It changes the data. So 
There's a number of filters available off the bat. You can add your own, obviously. In this particular case, I'm going to type trim, I suppose, something like that. Yeah, there we go. I'm looking for string trim, because I've decided that any artist that you send into my system will not have trailing white space. It's probably an error on your part. I can just strip off the trailing white space. Don't send me some blank space. It's not interested. I'm also making the decision that my artists do not have HTML in them. So I can strip out any HTML tags as well. So now I've filtered my data. Now I can add some validation. The validation is a yes, no thing. So this is the point where I'm saying, this data is not allowed unless it matches this requirement. So DB record exists, digits there, for instance, email address. This data must look like an email address. If it doesn't look like an email address, I am not accepting it. I'm not going to try and guess what you meant. I'm just saying no. That's what validation does. You just say no. In this particular case, I've got a varchar 100, so I'm going to stick a string length field uh, validator on, sorry, and then add my validator, and I can then set an option. These are the options for the string length one. I pick max, and I give it a value of 100. So not particularly complicated, but I've now set up a 100 maximum length for my string length. Obviously, I do this for every other field, but I'm not going to waste your time and show you me doing it on screencast, because that's pretty boring. Just assume I've done it. OK, so there we go. That's fields in our admin system. And we now have validation. If we post with an empty title, or an empty artist, rather, then we're going to get a 422. 422, unprocessable entity. It is an HTTP problem structured response. So we've got a detail, which is found validation. We've got the status code again. We have the title, which is always the same as the status code's name. We have the particular part of RFC 2616 as to why we've done this. And then we give the validation messages. So one of the nice things about HTTP, HTTP problem is that we can add additional data that's relevant for the particular error response we are sending. So if you're going to fail a validation thing, it's good manners to tell the client what they've failed on. So in this case, value is required and can't be empty. You could obviously customize the messages. One of the side effects of having done this via the administration system is that we've now got structured information about the data that this API accepts. If we have structured data about something, we can turn it into documentation. So you get documentation for your API for free, pretty much. You still have to write, you still have to write some stuff. Yeah. Um, not me, someone else. I'm not very good at it. It's automatically populated via the validation and the filtering admin, and it creates a new endpoint on your API, which is slash app agility, slash documentation, slash API name, slash version, which will provide your clients with the documentation about that endpoint. Because it's an app agility system in and of itself, it responds to both JSON and HTML. So if you hit it with a browser, you'll get a pretty format. If you hit it with an accept JSON header, then you'll get back JSON version of your documentation, which means your clients can then take that data and do something with it if they need to. And we also support Swagger so that you can export the documentation in Swagger format too. And there you go, you get some pretty sort of um, data comes, uh, some sort of uh, information about your albums. In this case, slash albums, the get response has got these fields with some information about them. Slash so database connected services. Code connected services provide more classes. There's more places for you to enter your own code. So here we have 
um, a loan resource, a loan collection, and a loan entity. If we're going to create, say, I want to lend out my music albums. In the loan resource class, this is the equivalent of a RPC controller. So the loan resource class will have eight methods in it, four for dealing with collections and four for dealing with entities. So fetch all, create, replace list, and delete list work on the collection. And fetch, patch, update, and delete will work on the entity for a single resource. You have to write your own code. So you'll be writing your own entities, you'll be writing your own services that do your persistence for you. That's all your problem. And then you fill in your resource. So fetch all, for instance, you might hit your service and call fetch all, create, delete, etc. You have to fill them in yourself. You're doing all the work. We have provided a skeleton. It's your API. You can write as complex an API as you would like. Final thing I want to talk about is authentication. Generally, it's a good idea to authenticate your APIs particularly if you're accepting data from outside, it's not a bad idea to know who has given you that data and who screwed it up. We support a variety of um, authentication methods. The most common ones are HTTP Basic and OAuth 2. If you're writing an internal API that's only used within your intranet, HTTP Basic is fine. Use SSL. But it's fine. It's not a problem. If you're doing public APIs, particularly if you're doing a public API that has got third-party applications that users of your service are connecting via, OAuth 2 is the way to do it. Don't try and invent your own system. Just use OAuth 2. It's built in. That makes it easier. Um, if you need to connect via, authenticate via LDAP or something like that, then you can hook into events within the system and do your own authentication. It's not a problem. HTTP Basic uses an HTTP password file. It's very similar to the Apache system, um, Ditto HTTP Digest. OAuth 2 will use databases because you now need to create um, tokens and things like that. There's a couple of good resources there to learn on how we do it. Um, B Shaffer's OAuth 2 server is the underlying component that AppAgility uses for OAuth 2. And it's set up via the admin, as you'd expect. You fill in some information about your database. And then the process is quite simple. You need to get an access token, and then you need to send it on subsequent requests. So as a client, it's not particularly complicated. Once I've got an access token, I send that header. And because I send that header every single time, I am still stateless. No sessions involved. The password grant type is the simplest. Your client sends a username and password directly to the OAuth endpoint and returns the access token directly. Only do this for trusted clients. So if you're writing the mobile app, you can allow your users to type their username and password into the mobile app. You can use the password grant type. If the mobile app is not written by you, and it's your users that are typing into it, then you don't want to be give, they don't want to give their username and password to that third-party client. And there's an authorization code workflow for that particular scenario. So in this case, the third-party client redirects to the AppAgility URL. Yes, you can skin it. And the user logs in on your system and then authorizes the client, test client in this case. And then that redirects back to the mobile client with the correct access token again. So it's not particularly complicated to implement a Wolf 2. There's not a lot you have to do for it. It's built into the system. You get to choose which particular methods require an authentication or an authorization header in order to run. So I can tick in the admin system that if you're going to edit the data, post, patch, put, or delete, then I would like you to be logged in. But if you just want to retrieve data, no problem. I don't need you to be logged in for that. Twitter, of course, disagrees with me on that one. 
Obviously, you can do it via code as well. So there's a method called this get identity, which you can then test if it is an identity object. If it is, then you have a logged in user. If it isn't, you don't have a logged in user. Very, very simple code to write. Authentication is very, very easy. It's also very boring. So that's it. That's an introduction to Agility. It provides the boring bits. That's what I like about it. It does the stuff that I think is fairly tedious to write. I think it's the sort of stuff that people don't want to write. So having it baked into a framework, I think, solves a number of problems, uh, particularly for the type of clients that I have, which are quite enterprisey. So content negotiation, discovery, um, error reporting, versioning, etc., all very, very helpful features of this tool. And I'm done talking. Has anyone got any questions? One over here. Well, we need the man with the mic who's disappeared. You got the mic? Man at the front here. Who had a question? I was wondering how, how AppAgility integrates with testing and what do you do about testing your APIs? Like how do you test your APIs? Um, you can do it at a number of levels. Firstly, you've got your source code that you need to worry about. And I use PHP unit for testing my source code. And it's no different from testing any other type of framework-based application, which means that all your real code should not be part of the framework. The framework is cool. The framework is doing its stuff. Your code lives in your modules, in your libraries, and you test those. So the only bit where you're crossing over is through the DI container. So you're injecting your business logic, all your business code, into Apigility's resource. So you only need to unit test the resource class, which should be really, really simple. Because most of the work is delegated out to your actual code base, your actual business logic, which is independently testable from App Agility. Um, minor rant, but that holds for any application you're writing. So if you're writing a Symfony 2 app or something like that, for instance, or Sam Framework 2 or Laravel or whatever, your code should live independent of the framework. If you're doing your job right, your code will live longer than whichever framework you're currently using. So keep it separate, keep it separately tested. So that's the actual code yourself. Then there's a the concept of um, integration testing of some form or another. Um, Frisbee is not bad for that. I don't know if you've heard that tool. It's a JavaScript-based thing. It runs on Node, which I don't understand as well as I ought to. And that hits your endpoints for you. And it's obviously integration testing at this point. And I find that quite handy for testing APIs before I put them live. Does that help? Okay. Any other questions? Um, yep. I was wondering how you would integrate the code created by AppAgility into a different framework. I assume all the error messages and all the uh, JSON formatting is via one of the classes you extend. But for example, I use Laravel, and that already has a base controller that the controllers extend. So you can't extend two controllers. Not very well, no. Um, you've got two ways to do it. One, you can treat your APIs independent from your current system, particularly if you split up your business logic properly. Alternatively, underneath the hood, all of AppAgility's code is separate components in Packagist. So there is a component in Packagist that does the JSON formatting. So you can grab that component out of Packagist and put it into your system that however your view model integrates in, I've got no idea, and hook into it that way if you need to pull out those particular bits. Um, you're kind of sort of just reusing the interesting bits of the Apagility tool in your own project, but you could certainly do that. Does that help? Anyone else? Uh, the code-based uh, approach where you, where you deliver your, your content from the database persists it yourself. Um, are there any 
the documentation that you get out of the box if you use the database connected one, uh, is, is that still something you can achieve with a code based one? Yeah, well, when I use the code connected um, API service, I'm still using the same validation system because the validation system works over any API within Apagility, and it fails early. It fails really early in the system. So I always use the validation system built into Apagility, hence that will also works with Code Connected and it works with DB Connected straight off the bat. So you, because you've filled in that data, you get the documentation by definition. Does that answer? Okay. Yep. Um, hi. Um, I was wondering if you have implemented validation in your code that you said should sit separately to the framework you're within. Can you bubble up validation messages from there and have it have the app agility serve that back in the JSON responses? Yes, you can. Um, very, very loosely, if you throw an exception, it turns into an API problem response. So I do validate my independent code because my code goes between multiple different frameworks. Um, now you've got the API running it, and I've also got a website that's not talking via the API, it just talks directly. So I've got one model layer, if you like, hence I have validation in there. And it does propagate up. It, I'm a little old school, so it returns, actually returns error type objects out of my system. And then I throw the exceptions within either the opportunity code or however I'm doing it in the other app. Yes, you can certainly do that. You don't have to use a validation system. It's just it's convenient to do so. Anyone else? Yes, I have a, a question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Where I work, for example, the front end is in AngularJS. Okay. So they don't want the results paged, for example, 20 results per page. They want to do the paging on the client side. Okay. But, however, if I send all of the results, it's too slow. Yes. So there almost needs to be a way to um, not do paging, but you know, limit the results in some sort of uh, based on the size of the result. Um, it's very difficult. Do you have any insight into that? You need to teach all Angular people to accept the real world. <laughs> very, very roughly. Um, we call it pagination, but what we actually mean is limited, limited result sets. And there is no sane way to write an API without limiting result sets or collections. It has to be done. And it's not difficult in Angular to go and do two requests to get all the data. It's really not hard. Um, the entire AppAgility admin, that's an Angular JS app. It talks to an AppAgility app API that actually does all the code creation work. So my personal view is that you teach your endpoint clients, your API clients, which I know they're part of your team or part of your company, to accept the reality of how APIs work and accept that they have to do that. There's, you can't have it both ways. If you give them all the data, it's going to be slow and it's going to run out of memory on a, a mobile device. So you have to give them a window into that device. I'm not sure that helps. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, how does it handle connections between entities? Let's say that uh, artists have many albums, and if I make a call to slash artist slash to slash album albums, yep. does it get me albums of that artist? Right. In a database connected API, as of today, no. Database connected APIs are only one table, one CRUD system. 1.1 is coming, the next version. There's some work being done on that for automatic discovery. I'm not sure how far it will go. So the way you actually do sub-resources and sub-collections and things like that is via the code connected API, at which point you can do whatever you like. Um, one really common way that's being used in a number of companies is using Doctrine. And there's a connector from Apagility to Doctrine, a um, packages component, because everything's on packages nowadays. So you go and find that component, you plug it in, and now Apagility becomes doctrine aware, and go from there. Or write it all yourself. That's my preferred method, but then I'm old school. 